Okay, well, welcome. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Um, so, I'm a teacher, but I'm not a podium teacher. I don't, I'm used to like small groups in a circle. So, I want to be close to you. <laughs> and, and I really feel like um, there's something to be worthwhile and happen here with us. Um, it needs to also happen between us. And so, having you be a part of that is really important. And, and I'm not really a person who likes to talk at people. So, um, so I'll kind of talk a little bit about um, um, the book, and, and um, but I think what I'd like to do before we start is I kind of like to hear just a, like one little statement from hopefully each of you about what drew you to this, um, if you actually knew what you were coming to or not. <laughs> Um, but if there was, if there was just sort of one short little statement of what what you found curious about the title or whatever it might have brought you here today, we have a brave person that will start. Thank you. Um, well, I'm all I'm very interested in metaphor, um, mythology, paradox, all these things that help explain what you're experiencing. But my when I read about it. My mother was treated for breast cancer, mm -hmm. and then she was given a um, preventative medicine, tamoxifen, and she took that for a couple years, but then the doctor stopped it because the studies were showing that women were mm -hmm. having endometrial cancer, and that's actually what caused her death. So when I read your presentation, I thought, wow, oh, that sounds like, especially if Thing with Medusa and the archetype. I just, that's what drew me. I was interested in uh, learning more about the archetypes of Medusa and Athene. Um, they, they, in, in my experience, they seem to be misunderstood. Yeah. Well, as your sister-in-law, yeah. <laughs> um, it's that. <laughs> no. It just I've been hearing about your research and what you've been studying here at Pacifica and how it's manifested itself in your professional life um, over Christmas dinners. And so I thought it would be wonderful to be here and and hear about it live and and especially in a group. Of people here. Yes. I'm here just because I also have struggled with endometriosis for many years, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to hear your perspective on the mythology um, around it. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I um. I'm fascinated by the way you uh, intertwine these different spaces of biology and mythology. And, um, I'm very interested in the way you kind of communicate those spaces in different ways. Thanks. Um, after going through a dissertation myself, I feel like what I've become more and more interested in is the relationships between these different characters. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just very curious about that between Athena and Medusa. I don't know that relationship. I feel like that's a whole other poetry that happens between characters. So that's why I am most excited. Mm -hmm. yeah. I 
anybody else? Um, I'm interested in metaphysics and um, how myth can help heal, and just how, how we're taken by our potential energies. Me too. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That just helps me kind of know what is in the room, right? Um, yeah, so this idea about um, the mythology of disease. Um, Jung said that the, uh, the gods had become our diseases. So what does that mean? Um, and that exploring what the mythic meaning of that is, um, and specifically the archetypal symbolism of a particular disease, in this case endometriosis. So there's, there's sort of an academic exercise that, that could be interesting. Um, and, and then, but, but for me, it was really a much more personal, um, it was driven from a much more personal place um, of suffering, of suffering with a condition that nobody knows what causes it, nobody knows how to cure it. Treatments are um, really focused on pain management, um, which means hopefully you can get out of bed in the morning, right? Um, and um, and there are just a lot of, and then it's very entangled with menstruation in general. And so a lot of the same taboos, the same um, misogynistic attitudes, the same suppression um, that you have in that whole arena, um, it gets amplified in, with endometriosis because there's sort of this idea that that women's processes, or biological processes like menstruation and pregnancy are already kind of diseases, right? And then it, then it turns out it is a disease, right? And it's just this double whammy of, of um, potential shame. And, um, and as, a, as a woman who's um, suffered from this disease for many years, and then did research on it um, so that I heard other women's stories, uh, there's a real um, tendency for the medical field not to be very responsive, very um, supportive, very understanding. And that's not to say they're not individuals in the field that, that are really working hard um, to render aid and, and be skillful practitioners. But just as a general experience, over and over and over again, the stories are there about harm, psychological harm, if not physical harm. So, um, so I, got, I got curious about it because um, the disease manifested in some very extreme ways in me. Um, particularly, I uh, had had a hemorrhage when I was pregnant with my first pregnancy, about seven months in, and I lost both. I was pregnant with twins, and I lost the twins because of this massive hemorrhage and this confusion over what was going on, because it was very strange. And, and it turns out that the endometriosis had actually um, flourished during pregnancy, which it's not supposed to do, um, but it did and um, had created a weakness in this artery and, well, and on and on. So, uh, and then I also, near, I also had a near-death experience during that process. So, uh, I'd already had the chronic pain and I'd had all the other kinds of things, but that really got my attention, which, which death will do. Um, it took that. <laughs> um, so, um, but that was, that was a long time ago, and I still didn't really have the capacity to quite navigate what was happening, but, but it put me on a path towards trying to have a deeper relationship and understanding. And, and what happened synchronistically at that, in, in my recovery time was I encountered Joseph Campbell. And so, uh, 
in particular the power of myth, the Bill Moyers, the, that's whole phenomenon, right? And uh, I was so excited because I felt like I had discovered a way of understanding, a, a, a portal into understanding these really difficult existential experiences I had that I didn't really have any kind of frame, you know, for. And that led me to Jung, and that led me to Hillman, and that led me to Marianne Woodman, and it, it just, you know, ended up with a PhD in mythological studies, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as part of my experience of the disease from sort of a psychological or imaginal perspective, I had these intuitions about the disease being Medusan. I, don't, I had no, it was not something that I conjured or invited or consciously uh, courted. It was something that emerged in dreams. It was something, it was, it was something that felt descriptive of the kinds of physical experiences I had, the kind of, the kind of sort of rageful pain. Uh, and then also just some of the biological aspects of the disease have an uncanny resonance with the Medusa. So, for example, the Medusa is sort of known mythically for being able to turn you to stone. Right? Whether she looks at you or you look at her and there's different versions of the myth, but to be caught in the gaze or to gaze at the Gorgon um, is, is to be turned to stone, to be petrified. Uh, and so, um, one of, the, one of the things with endometriosis is that because it creates internal bleeding, what happens is tissue that's very similar to what's inside the uterus is outside the uterus. And it responds to the hormone fluctuations of the monthly cycle and, and bleeds. It swells and bleeds. And so you're bleeding internally, basically, with no containment. And that creates a great deal of scarring. And so over time, uh, it can create <coughs> webs of scars and can also um, really cause scarification of, of the organs themselves. So the organs turn to stone, essentially, and, and surgeons use language like that. Um, they use language like, you know, chipping concrete out of the inside of the, the peritoneum. They talk about um, frozen pelvis, which is when the, the reproductive organs have sort of all fused together into a sort of a solid mass, and it's very, it is very stone-like. It's like petrification. Um, another resonance with the two, the, the mythology and the disease that I um, encountered even before I entered this world um, of mythology in any serious way was that the, um, in the mythology, when Medusa's head is removed, when she's decapitated, the blood from one side of her neck is healing, and the blood from the other side of her neck is deadly. So it becomes what we call the pharmacon, the pharmacy. And Athena, the goddess Athena, gifts that to the god of healing, the great god of healing, Asclepius. She gifts him the pharmacon from the Medusa's blood. So there's this, this curious reality in the mythology about these, these two qualities of the blood. With endometriosis, the blood from the womb, the blood that nourishes me life, becomes destructive. And um, so that, again, it, it just felt, I just couldn't, she just wouldn't leave me alone. <laughs> Imaginally, right? And that, and so, um, so I just sort of uh, started to follow that thread. And um, when, once I, once I was to the point where it was time to write a dissertation and I was casting around for all the cool possibilities, I was like, oh, Celtic, I could go to Ireland. I, you know, oh, I live in New Mexico. The Native American traditions are fabulously rich and at my fingertips. But that was not going to happen. And that's kind of what happens here at Pacifica. Something, it, it just comes and gets you, and, and that's what happens. So, but the good news is that um, it was an incredible ride, an incredible journey and an incredibly healing journey. And that is also what I've discovered is, is to me the most um, potent part of mythological studies for me is this, this capacity for story to help us heal. 
and this capacity for us to restory our experience in ways that does not require us to deny the lived experience of suffering. Um, because there's just a little too much of that in, from my taste. There's a little too much of just the bright, shiny, um, you know, just let it go, uh, just look at the bright side. And that doesn't feel like true resilience to me because I have the experience. And, and it's a chronic disease, it doesn't go away. Some women do go into remission and they are not symptomatic. Uh, I'm not one of those people. So, um, uh, and I have two daughters who have now been diagnosed. So there's a lot invested in how do I live with this joyfully without that being sort of a strange, morbid, masochistic <laughs> relationship. Uh, but this is my one wild and precious life. And so um, it feels to me that God, those are really compelling questions. And it feels to me like mythology is, is a way to answer those questions. It's not the only way. It just happens to be the way that calls to me. And it seems like it probably calls to you, and that's why you're here. So, um, so the dissertation eventually got rewritten as this book. And... Um, and so let me just tell you a little bit about what that is. Um, so looking at the archetypal significance of endometriosis personified through the Gorgon Medusa and the goddess Athena. What happened was first a, an, expo an exploration of the disease. So there's sort of three characters in the story. The first is endometriosis. So there, so even if you think after having it for 40 years or whatever, and having seen many doctors and had many procedures, that I would have been an expert. I was amazed how little I knew. And part of that is because there was no internet when I was when I was diagnosed. But part of it is that I was busy living life and didn't want to be identified with my disease. Right? And part of it was there's just a whole lot of misinformation out there, and doctors are not particularly forthcoming with information, um, very often, at least in my experience, and in the experience of other people who I've read. So, so I did a ton of research and, and really engaged this disease as a life partner who I really wanted to know. Um, and I mean, I'm, I've been dancing with this partner, and I'm going to be dancing with this partner in different forms. And so, who is this? And um, and in that process, even though that was really you know based in the biological sciences and physiology and medical texts and the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet and, and original papers that I was you know deciphering and um, from the scientific realm, what what happened is it, it really the disease really did take on a personality. Um, and the personality was really Medusan. And, and it really came through, even that medical research, because it came through in, in attitudes, misogynistic attitudes in so-called scientific papers. You know, really uh, negative assumptions about a woman's ability to truthfully speak her experience. Uh, negative assumptions about um, about the value of our processes, our biological processes, and and I did research all the way back to to ancient Egypt, some of the very first sort of texts that that medical test texts that are uh, have ever been found have to do with women's gynecology, <laughs> and it's because reproduction has always been important, right? It's always been important to, under, to understand it in whatever way that a society could at that point. And it's also been important to control it. Especially once the sort of patriarchy um, really got in place. That paternity became, and controlling paternity became really important. So there's been a lot of curiosity about it for a long time. So there are a lot of, there's a surprising amount of information if you, if you decide that's where you want to go. So, so that that was a process of really getting to know the disease, and and that character sort of started to form a personality, 
Um, so then that, that it made it very clear that Medusa was who I was dealing with. So then I needed to engage Medusa. And you know, I, I have this, this PhD in mythological studies. You'd think I would know a lot about Greek mythology, but again, I knew some things, but boy, was there so much to learn. So first I, I went into her iconography, which is the images. Because what happens is um, the Gorgon is a, is a very old sort of what we'll call it like construct. It's an old archetypal image. So an archetype is, is an energy pattern in, in our psyche. Okay. So in the same way that we have instincts, which are tendencies towards certain behaviors, we have those young felt, felt and observed that we have those same kind of constructs in our psyches, right? In our non-material reality, right? And those constructs are archetypes, but they're energy patterns. So they, they can take a lot of different forms when they become concrete, because they're just energy, right? So, um, so the Gorgon is one mask or one image um, for some kind of energy pattern that humans experience in their psyches. And, and to me, what that the sort of the best description for that, and it's, it's still kind of unwieldy, um, is this this experience of unmitigated feminine potency. And I'm going to use you know the the word feminine as an archetypal phenomenon, fully aware that we are in in the throes of deconstructing feminine, masculine, male, female, all of it. I get that. Um, however, I'm dealing with an estrogen-dependent disease of the female reproductive organs. So I'm going to use female, I'm going to use feminine, and, and that's going to just be part of that. And, for, and, and it will be somebody else's task to deconstruct that. that that's not something that I am competent to do. So I'm going to, I am going to use that language. So, so unmitigated feminine potency. Another way, make, maybe for some people, if they're familiar with this kind of language, is this idea of the numinous tremendum. So the numinous is just the idea of something sacred, something transcendent. You can use the word God, but it's, it's non-religious, you know, when you talk about the numinous. Um, tremendum, the awesomeness. And I like to think of, you know, standing before a massive thunderstorm on top of a 14,000 foot peak. That is the luminous tremendum. It's mesmerizing, it's fascinating, it's awesome. And I better get the heck off that mountain top fast. <laughs> right? I think if any of you saw the, the movie The Life of Pi, there's a scene when he's in the huge storm and his raft, and he is, you know, in adoration, he's in awe. He's he is he is before the, the tremendum. Right? Now when he tries to expose the, the poor tiger to that, his instincts, it's too much. He needs to keep that trauma, <laughs> keep that protected, okay? But, but you get the idea of what that is. So there's a, there's a, a feminine aspect to that, and that's what I, I feel like the Gorgon is. And so you can trace that energy and that kind of face, which is the, the wide eyes and the, the Lolling tongue and lolling fangs, like boar's tusks, um, wings, the, the wings of birds or the wings of bees, um, uh, the, and then the, the serpent piece, the, the serpent hair, um, and you can trace those those uh, pieces of the imagery back into multiple cultures. And, and deeper into time. And um, I did rely on the research of Maria Nabutas, who we have over here in the Opus archives. Um, and, and some of her research is controversial, but there's just thousands and thousands of images of actual artifacts. And, and I just looked at those, right? Just like she did. And, and you see the imagery. And it's the eyes, the, like owl eyes, or like serpent eyes, there's something mesmerizing, fascinating, petrifying, awesome about that. So, so that process of looking at the imagery took me back 
uh, out before Greece, back into northern Africa, um, all around the Mediterranean, Crete. All, so this imagery of the Gorgon. And Medusa is just one version. Medusa is a Greek version of the Gorgon. She's one of three Gorgons, her sisters. And she happens to be the only one of the three that is both a goddess and a mortal. And that may seem like a weird motif until we stop for a moment and we remember that that motif exists elsewhere, for example, in Christianity. Right? There are God human. There's a God human at the center of the Christian myth, right? So there's some that there's some of so that got my curiosity. There's something going on there. That's interesting. That's a real paradox. Right? If it's paradox, it's probably true. So I'm gonna follow that. Um, so so then so I so I worked both with the general idea of the Gorgon and then also the specific stories around Medusa. Um, and then that moved, then I moved into story. Right, after I've really been in a lot of this, I, these images. And in a lot of the images, she's full bodied still. And she's very, very powerful um, stances, physical stances. Um, and, and so, again, in those more ancient traditions, she's not just a head, she's not just a mask. What's going on with, with that, that archetypal energy of the unmitigated feminine potency? through time, through culture. So the stories that I looked at really focused in again on, on the, the Greek, ancient Greek, and then the Greco-Roman. So it's, it's, the, it's the early, I didn't look at modern culture, um, partially because for me, I was, I was dealing with the body, and I was dealing with trauma. And, and as, a, as a trauma therapist, one of the things that we understand is that you have to go back to the beginning. And, and you go back to the, to the basic, uh, first level of experiencing, which is embodiment, and what's in the body. So for me, that that parallel, and it felt to me like it directed me back to the, that bedrock of story. Her poesy is still alive. All you have to do is look at, you know, go go home and Google Google images, and there's all kinds of imagery. A lot of it's highly sexualized, which is a whole other book, right? Uh, and and our relationship with that in, in modern. In our modern culture, but uh, so so we really looked at those stories, and there are a lot of stories about Medusa, but they're never really about her. She's really never the protagonist in her story. <coughs> um, and then and so without going into any of those particular stories for at this moment, that led me to Athena, and again I really didn't know where I was going. As I was going, I was, it was really truly driven by curiosity, and, and and there really wasn't much of an agenda other than what does this mean, and how can I understand my own story in a way that is healing and doesn't um, support the, the sense of victimhood, because I wasn't fully really interested in that, and also doesn't deny my lived experience of suffering, which is also important. so. Um, and the reason that it led me to Athena is that in, in the Greek tradition, Athena basically creates the Gorgon. The Greek tradition kind of ignores, um, at least the, the big stories that we know, kind of ignores that the Gorgon's been around for 5,000 years <laughs> in other cultures. Um, and, and the stories that, that the story that most if people know any story about Medusa, they usually know Ovid's version, which is that Medusa was a beautiful young woman, a beautiful maiden, and her glory was her hair, and she is in Athena's temple and unfortunately captures the attention of Poseidon, who is fascinated and rapes her. And Athena sees this violation and covers her face with her aegis, which is her, her shield, and then punishes Medusa by turning her into the Gorgon. And then sends Perseus after Medusa, the monster, to behead her. And in all versions, even when there's the Perseus is the hero who's doing the actual um, chopping, it's, it's Athena's hand that guides or Athena, who actually does the beheading. So Athena, 
you, you can't study Medusa without ending up at Athena. And even then, what's interesting too is even before that, so then once that threat starts happening, go back and, and there are areas of northern Africa where uh, Athena probably seems to have come from, and the Gorgon has come from, and there are stories where they are conflated. There's a story where um, the, there were three sisters who are princesses who rule kingdoms after their father dies in, in, in this region of northern Africa. And the prize of possession of the kingdom is a golden statue of Athena called the Gorgon. So even back farther, there's this interweaving. There's this, this um, conflation of these goddesses. So that's how, that's how the, our three characters got set up, right? And so then there was work to do around Athena, but all of the work around Athena was delimited by the, the, her relationship with Medusa, because you can get lost in Greek myth. There's just stories and stories and stories. And one story leads to another story, and it's just too big, right? So, but, so I really focused in on on Athena, and I, and I and I didn't. I didn't like Athena. <laughs> I didn't want to study Athena. Athena seems like a sellout to me, right? The Athena I knew was the Athena of the of the play, the playwright, um, Aeschylus, right? Who wrote about um, after uh, Orestes kills his mother. Um, to avenge his father, who his mother had killed. <laughs> this is a great tragedy, right? Uh, he flees. Now, he's had to kill his mother because the gods have told him he has to do that, right? It's tough being a human. Then he's in big trouble because only one god told him to do it, and that means the other gods are coming after him. And the other the gods are coming after him are called the Furies. And the Furies are goddesses, ancient, ancient goddesses, Kind of like the Medusa, there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of crossover here. So it's like a bunch of Medusas coming after him to avenge the, the blood of his mother. Their ancient um, feminine justice is what Marie Van France calls of them. So she's a Jungian who wrote a lot about fairy tales and, and myths. And she talks about this quality of feminine justice being a quality of justice that is like natural consequences, as opposed to human law, which she calls masculine justice. You can take or leave those terms. But. So they come after him. So he flees to Apollo. Save me, save me. You told me to do this. You said you'd protect me. Well, Apollo is in a tight spot, because these are ancient goddesses, and he has, they're, they're really outside of his power. He really can't protect Orestes from these gals. They're really after him, and he's done it. So they decide to have a trial, and Athena's the judge. And in the famous speech that she makes, she says, you know, I'm always for the, for the man and everything. I'm always for the father and everything, except marriage. Marriage is good for women, but I'm always... Yeah. And so this is the person, this is the goddess that I'm going to relate to, so, um, but it turns out that that, that, that reading of, not of that goddess and of, even of that play, once they got a more nuanced relationship with the material, um, has been simplified for the, for the purpose of supporting the cultural Times, right? And Joseph Campbell talked about that one of the functions of myth was to support the belief system of the culture, right? And so, yeah, I, I get it. When I learned that, when I read that play in high school and got that, that version that, yes, Athena's the, she's got uh, Zeus's right hand man in the, in the dress, and she is the daughter of the patriarchy, and, and she's the defender of the status quo, and and that's the version I got. Um, and so no wonder it wasn't she wasn't somebody that that um, that I wanted to emulate. Of course, I was emulating her because I was also a daughter of the patriarchy. 
And um, I had this relationship of, of both I probably identifying with her unconsciously by being a perfectionist, super student, good girl, people pleasing, defender of, right? And yet um, also very, very easily identified with my feminine rage, with the Medusa part too. So there's that split. So, um, so, so, as I started, so, so then I sort of had everything laid out. I had my three characters. I started to get to know who they were from their stories, from their imagery, um, from the experience, the embodied experience. And, 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 I, and so it was sort of a simple amplification process. So for those of you who are familiar with Hillman or Jung, you take an archetypal image in a dream, you dream about a dog, and you get curious about that, and the dog is never just a dog, and you start to look up all the different meanings of dog, you start to put your own associations with dogs, you start to put your memories, and you expand the image, that's called amplification, and that's, that's pretty much what the process was, right? It's character development or it's amplification. And so, what, what I had then was sort of the, the foundation for, for who was engaged in, my, in this story. But it was all sort of from here up, right? And the experience was really from here down. So that's when it kind of gets interesting, and that's when I think we need ways of engaging mythological material that is more personal, more imaginal, and more active. And that's things like active imagination, which is a technique of um, interacting with symbols and with our own imaginations so that we can have a dialogue. And, um, and then there are, and, and there are also other kinds of traditions that, that support that. There are shamanic traditions that support that kind of that work. Um, other dream work tools that support that kind of work. Um, and so that was that was sort of the next piece, was to actually engage these conjured entities, these characters, and see what they had to say. Right? So that becomes, I think, the subjective part to a certain extent. However, when you're interacting with, with archetypal energies, there's always something collective going on. And my sense of that is you just put it out there and see where, see where it lands for people. Um, so that's sort of the process of the book. Um, and, 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 and sort of my process in general, right? Um, So where that took me was a transformation of the disease and the goddesses. And that's probably, that's sort of more along what some of you were interested in. Because once I started to deeply interact with, especially Medusa and Athena, it was clear that and deeply interact with their stories, their, their richer stories and their older stories, it became clear that there was something strange going on with the, the relationship between those two goddesses. This, this story that, that Athena is jealous or is embarrassed or <laughs> whatever, this sort of oversimplification of what that relationship was that, that, that um, made Athena go after Medusa with such a vengeance. And, and what, in, what I ended up really seeing in the, in the deeper, more nuanced reading of the mythology was that while Athena's standing up there making that speech, I'm always for the man and everything, 
In the meme behind her back, she's telling the Furies, those fierce goddesses of blood and wrath and vengeance, you are ancient and we have to honor you. You are an ancient feminine power and we have to honor you. I would like you to be at the center of my temple. Would you come and be at the center of my temple? And they're transformed into the amenities, but they're still what they are. And they have a new name, but they are still that fearsome, unmitigated feminine power. But so she's doing some, she's, she's, you know, she is, have, she has to be in the civilization that she is in. And in fact, she's the champion of that civilization. I mean, Athena, Athens is Athena's city, and they are her people, and she is their mother. And it's her job to protect them. And they, this unmitigated feminine power is, you better get off that 14,000 foot peak. So, but, and, and, and then I realized, oh, and not only is she doing that there, and it plays out in other stories, but like keeping it to that one story is helpful, I think. I also noticed that, okay, every image of Athena, guess what's right here? It's the Gorgon. The face of the Gorgon. It's called the Gorgonian. And it is the, the face of the Gorgon. It is on her, they call it her aegis or her breastplate. And, and now that shows up in some other warriors, but it's always right there with Athena. So, again, on the, on, the, on the one hand, she's out there cutting off Medusa's head or guiding Perseus's hand as he does it and loaning him the right shield so that he won't get petrified and getting Hermes to loan him the right sword so he would be able to do the job, and, 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 right? All of this, all these implications in, in this process. And then she's wearing the, the Gorgon's face on her person. So there's something trickstery going on here. I had never really realized what a trickster Athena actually is. And I don't know if Chris Downey would agree with that, but that's where I came. <laughs> was, wow, wait a minute, there's something really going on here with Athena that, that I had missed because I bought that, I bought the myth, the myth as lie, or the myth as one truth of my time about who this goddess was, and had missed this, these, these other um, realities that were right in front of my face. Um, so, so I got really curious about what's the meaning of the beheading. And I think that's one of the questions that I keep asking myself, as this is an interesting, important question, because it's pivotal to this relationship between these two goddesses. Because it could mean that the monster needs to be slayed. That's what it's meant for a long time. And we have lots of stories about the monster has to be slayed. And part of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey a lot of times requires that you go in, you know, the hero goes in and slays the monster and gets the boon and comes back. But I'm noticing that the monster isn't really getting slayed if she now lives on the goddess's person. I mean, really, Athena is two-faced in every sense of that term. She is two-faced. And, um, and yet she's whole. So it's not like this is not a part of her identity. This is a part of her identity. It's her heart chakra. It's the, the essence of her identity. Uh, and in fact, typically people think Athena doesn't have a mom because the, the story a lot of people learned in elementary school was that Zeus's you know, head gets cracked open and Athena springs from his head fully formed. Well, guess what he had just done the page before? <laughs> he had swallowed his pregnant wife, Metis, the goddess of wisdom. The goddess who knew more than any other god. And the reason he swallowed her when she was pregnant is because there was a prophecy that she would give birth first to a daughter who would be his equal, and then to a son that would usurp him. I'm going to have that. So he swallowed her. So he, he gave birth. You know, he couldn't sustain the pregnancy. 
<laughs> so she had a mother, and she had a mother who, in fact, Nidus is, is associated with what, the waters and the deep unconscious and the titans, and she's a first She's a first god. She's an earlier generation of gods, the Olympians. So we're looking again at this old, this old lineage, this deep lineage, backwards, just like the Gorgon. This maternal lineage into that um, Pythonic is one word you'll hear people say, and everybody pronounces it different, so hopefully that's close. Um, this tradition of, of this dark feminine, right? This, this other quality of the feminine. So, um, so, so you can see where all of this, the beheading starts to be a pivotal image about unpacking what the relationship is and what the possibilities are. And, and the thing about mythology that I love is this is just my, my bunch of strings that I'm weaving. And it, you get to do your own. And we can inform each other and learn from each other as we do that. And that can, it doesn't stop. In fact, Hillman believed that, that and, and Jung too, that we have to dream the myth forward. That the archetypal energy has to be kept alive. That once it gets equated with the image, with the symbol, then it dies. It becomes an empty, an empty sign like a plus sign instead of a cross, right? So it's, it, it's part of the fun that we get to keep draining this forward. And, and so that leads me back to the beheading, because if the beheading means we have to slay the beast, we have to slay the monster to get the boon, and that's where we're stuck, it feels to me like, yeah, we are kind of stuck there. And, and it feels to me like that's got some pretty negative Implications in the world right now because the, the the monster is the feminine is an aspect a huge aspect of the feminine and and it gets played out in our relationship to the masculine relationship to the feminine the male relationship to the female the human relationship to the planet right it feels like there's something important about being able to dream the myth forward around this need to slay the beast, to slay the kill the monster. Um, so what if the what if the beheading means something else? What if the beheading means um, what if the beheading means Athena co-opting female sexuality for the patriarchy? You could definitely mean that. I thought about that. Okay. Medusa was the beautiful sexual maiden, and Athena's the virgin goddess. We'll have none of that out of, outside of marriage. Um, but, but again, I looked at what Athena was actually up to, and the way that she incorporated the Gorgon into her own identity. And she is called Athena Gorgopas. That's one of her names. So it's not just this incidental thing, it's, it's part of our identity. And again, looking back to some of the older stories, there were other stories that really reinforced, I'm not sure that's what's going on, I don't think that's what it's about. So, um, so for me, what ended up with, where I ended up with the beheading, at least right now, was this reintegration, this reclaiming by Athena, the adapted female, yes, she lives in, in you know, phallocentric, patriarchal Greece. Holy cow. I had no idea just how bad it was until I started reading, you know, the history and reading texts from the time about the rules for women and about the, the, the control over their sexuality and the control over their lives. But it, so really, it became this reconciliation. It became this return of Athena's maternal lineage to the very center of her temple, and her, the very temple of her temple, her body as temple. And, and what struck me, though, was that that's still, it's still a pretty monstrous energy. I mean, 
the gorgon petrifies you. It's just not like you can make nice. She's gonna, it's gonna kill you. That that's the energy. It's the death energy. It is death. Death is still death. It's still a profound transformation that is pretty scary to the typical ego. Right? So she's not interested, she's not gonna change because I wanna be friends. This is not that simple, right? She is what she is, and she behaves how she behaves, because that's the truth of disease, that's the truth of death. Um, and yet, there she is at the center. So to me, that speaks to what's my relationship to those forces? What is, what's my relationship? How do I functionally approach that? How do I functionally approach the actual physical suffering, the actual death of children, you know, the actual um, lifetime of dealing with the disease, the, the passing on of the disease to my children? In the book, there's a poem that my daughter wrote right after her surgery that, that touched my heart and broke my heart. So how do you live with life as it actually is? Because Joseph Campbell said, you know, we're not interested in the meaning of life, we're interested in the experience of being alive. So my question is, okay, so what, is, what does it mean to be alive? But even more, what does it mean to be alive with pain and suffering and death and blood and all of it, right? So how do I approach the Gorgon? Because I don't, I don't get the feeling that cutting her head off, that killing the monster is working anymore. It didn't work for me. I tried many different ways, psychological, medical, um, and it seems to me that the, the clue is, is, is where she is situated, which is, at the, like I said, the heart chakra, the field of transpersonal objective love. So to me, that speaks to, to an approach of reverence, an approach of what Tara Brock calls radical acceptance, that, that deepest, deepest level of Yes. Not in agreement. Agreement and disagreement are irrelevant. My ego position, you know, when I was in, when I was basically dead and then coming back, my ego's sense of whether that was fair or not was completely irrelevant. It was off the table. It didn't matter. So that kind of acceptance of this is life and yes. So that reverence, that, that acceptance, um, that humility, because there's the shame piece and there's this sense of the sacredness of shame. There's a whole other conversation we could have, um, which you might want to have if you, apply, if you want to. And, and so humility, reverence, acceptance. And there's, even, there's a story in the Ovid's Metamorphosis, about after uh, Perseus has rescued Andromeda, and they're going to be they're they're married they're, being, they're now married right they're the royal couple. Um, he is his sword is covered with blood, and he's washing his he's got to clean his sword. He goes to the water's edge, and he has um, the Gorgon's head, which he's been wielding as a weapon. He's been just causing mayhem, you know, the ego with this power, unmitigated feminine rage, it's like, yeah, I'm killing all my enemies, I'm just, he's been really kind of running amok, and, and, but he's done this good thing, so he goes and he has to wash the sword of blood, and so he t tenderly, so out of character, he tenderly takes her head, and he, he lays out um, seaweed and fronds and plants on the sand so that it's not to damage Head and he gently lays the head with reverence and protection on, on the seaweed. 
while he's washing the sword. And, and what happens then is that the supple, green, soft seaweed petrifies because she is what she is. It is what it is. And turns to coral, is the story. So the sea nymphs, these, these feminine spirits that are playing around in the water, they see this and they get curious. They have this blind curiosity about the power. They don't have an agenda. They're not attached to the outcome. They're just thinking, wow, did you see what that did? And they start playing with it and spreading the, spreading the magic across the water, creating coral reefs, one of the most fecund and fertile ecosystems on the planet. Until we heat the, the ocean up too much, of course, but that's another story. So yeah, so what is that, right? That is the extension of death back to the old wisdom that death was always connected with rebirth. That the goddess of death is the goddess that gives birth. And the, the Gorgon energy held at the level of the heart in that transpersonal field of objective love approached with reverence, approached with radical acceptance and humility, doesn't change her nature, but I can live with her. And I can, and I can learn from her. And I can be in a joyful relationship with my female body exactly as it is, with its pain and pleasure. I don't have to fix anything. And I can live in joy and love. And those can be gifts of the Gorgon as well. So, those are some thoughts. Hopefully, someone cohesive and coherent. Thank you for listening. In that form, I think that's a good way to, to kind of nuance it. Because what happened is it got it sort of gets recreated because in fact the Gorgon is a much older lineage okay. that had been um, incorporated by Zeus when he swallowed Edith, right? So the line, the lineage, the maternal line doesn't really isn't really gone, but it's disappeared. It's, it's obscured. And and when Athena does that, she a new symbol of it is born, right? And and so in that way, she does create that, right? Or recreate that. Thinking about why she was there, not to have that facility from the side of the body, but she also sort of co created in a way. Yeah, I think that is, that's, yeah, that, that can be a way of thinking about it that has meaning and resonance because um, and that's the way the story is. So it's like, you get curious about that version of the story and what it's telling you and how you understand it and how it resonates for you. Um, yeah, yeah, because she does. And then there's all these ways of understanding that story, and there are a lot of different kinds of interpretations about, you know, when you I, when I just read the story, there's nothing about jealousy in that story. But you read some versions or you read some commentary or whatever, and it's, oh, well, she was, she was, you know, or she was, you know, Athena's kind of prudish, you know, and, and I mean, but you, read, you just read the story, it's not there, so there's room in these myths for you to interact with them, right? And then it, so it's kind of is, is Medusa the shadow? Right, we were actually talking about, so that's one way to kind of look at it, is, is, is the shadow, Right, um, and I think that that's, I think that makes a lot of sense, and, and I think it's also, there's also something about a depth there. There's something less personal, there's a lineage that Medusa connects Athena back to, which is that older, um, older goddess kind of, of, of tradition, um, both in terms of the, um, 
the anthropology, the, the cultural traditions that pre exist in Greece, as well as sort of just psychologically. <coughs> Brings her back into a line with the the lunar or the shadow or the dark or the demonic or whatever feminine that has been um, repressed, that's being rejected by this very solar cognitive rational, right? The, the rise of those values. So it it it's, it, it can be sort of a personal shadow if you forgot us kind of a personal shadow, but also there's also this sense of this. This reconnecting with something deep, which probably what I mean, our shadows kind of do, right? All the, all the really good learning comes out of the pain that our shadow brings us. <laughs> At least that's my experience. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it also comes up a little bit for me as, as connecting with an animalistic rage and the feminine and the animal spirit. I think there's something there. Yeah. I was wondering the lineage of. The Gorgon, I just know that in, in uh, modern Greek, Gorgona is the mermaid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so mm -hmm. she's the half animal, half human. And if that rage is the more um, sexual, driven, maybe the animalistic integration of carrying you know, the animal spirit, like a talisman right. on your chest. Well, I think that rawness that you're talking about, that, that, that raw affect. Right, whatever that raw instinct, whether that's the um, the rage or the sexuality or whatever it is, it's that unmitigated. It's that raw, um, sort of dehumanized as a not human, right? Mm -hmm. And and it gets pulled in, and the, icon the iconography is full of animal imagery. And she, the Gorgon, gets tied back to an another sort of class of goddesses called the the, um, the Lady of Beasts. Or the goddess of the animals, or you know that whole cluster of goddesses that are so deeply um, entwined with with animals and have animal um, familiars and features. Yes, and the features as in the intelligence, the intuition of the animal, and integrating that. You know, I think that's interesting that it's the the head and uh, it's life and death. So that sounds very animalistic, and yeah. just the enhancement of the of the animal. Yeah, I like the, the way you're talking about that being, um, it's, it's bringing that intuition and that wisdom into relationship with the rational, right? We don't really, I mean, we do, there's a lot of good in the rational. There's a lot of beauty and elegance, and I, I mean, a lot of the work I did was very much in that realm. I really value that the rigor and the elegance of that. And so it is bringing those things into relationship. I think that's really potent. And there's a piece about the head that I didn't bring up that's like it's a whole other thing because the head, in, in ancient Greece, the understanding of reproduction was that the spark, the soul, the animating reality was in the male, not in the female, and it was in the male's head. And so you, you get, there's all kinds of interesting ways that that has translated into our language about all kinds of parts of our anatomy, right? <laughs> but um, so the head becomes the seed, and it's but it's, but but in Greece it's the male head that's the seed. The female is the female is matter and it's dead, right? It's in, it's inert, and the male seed enlivens the inert and gives it form. Okay, so the fact that the Medusa is is now this. Her head is harvested. I, Hermes uses Hermes loans Perseus a scythe to cut her head off. He doesn't use a sword. He uses a tool that you harvest the grain. So there's this whole piece that also takes her back into the grain goddesses and into this harvesting of the head, which is the seed, the soul seed, the animating seed of life. And yet she's the death mask. So there we go. So life and death, life, death, rebirth. It was always a it was always circular. It wasn't linear. That's a that's a much more recent experience of being alive, associated with our individuality and our connection to our ego as identity. And my ego dies, I'm done. But that's not always been the way that humans experienced being alive. I mean, death is always death. I'm not in a big hurry either. <laughs> you know, my ego kind of likes being here. So, but yeah, I think all those pieces start coming. So you you also get the sense of of the, the head being, um, and that makes her even more of a trickster, that she's 
that she's harvested that, that old claim to the female or feminine um, having something to do with being a soul. Because in Greece, women didn't have souls. They had a distorted soul. They had a partial soul. Men had a whole soul. Women had this weird partial sort of, they were alive, but... <laughs> um, so, so it was that she was again being very tricksy with what she was up to, bringing that old, you know, way of understanding um, reproduction, generativity, and, and putting it right in her face. <laughs> and next to the heart, which and, is uh, the heart chakra, which is the healing. So it was kind of also maybe taking the head of the healing, you know, and having a more somatic approach that sounds very Yes. If you could back up for me, if I, I might have missed this, you said it, but was Medusa the way she was because she became that way from being punished, or was she born that way? Right, so there's different stories, uh -huh. and in the, in the Ovid story from the Metamorphosis that I talked about, um, she's a beautiful maid right. with beautiful hair, yes. right? But there are a lot of other stories, and if you go back to Hesiod, Hesiod is the Greek who wrote sort of their creation myth, and he collected all kinds of stories, so he's got lots of stories, and you can really get into the nitty gritty. In that, in that older story, she and her three, there's three Gorgons, and they're all Gorgons. I mean, they're goddesses with serpent hair and, they just and mesmerizing away. eyes, and they can all petrify you. And they all live at the edge of the world in the West, which is where it's associated with death and, and the unconscious and the unknown and the edge of consciousness, all that. And they were always that way. And in, that, in those older stories, in fact, Medusa, who is a goddess and a, and a mortal, um, the story about her engagement with Poseidon is, is, is that she's a goddess and that she lay with Poseidon in a bed of spring flowers and conceived, um, you know, Pegasus. And, uh, you know, I mean, totally different story. Totally different story. And the, the relationship between the water god and this, this, this good line goddess. So, but, so that's again the richness of when you start playing around with these stories. Yeah. And, and if you want one story, don't, don't do this. Because <laughs> it's not the way it works. But if you, find, if you find that richness, and you like that sense of paradox and contradiction, you know, then, then this mythological approach is really, really rich. Because there's a lot of different versions, but yeah, so. Yes and no. Mm. Yeah. Well, it, the the emotionality in myth is overwhelming, mm. and it's like that's what drives so much of the behavior and the stories of the myth is so and so slept with so and so, and then so and so was mad and put mm. a hex on him and all that stuff. And with Medusa, you know, Western culture, we're pretty much taught whatever little bit of emotional life starts to grow in our culture. You know, so that's, you're, you're supposed to turn to stone. Mm -hmm. But I'm not quite sure the connection between why she's the one that turns you to stone. And that's why I wondered if she was always that way or the punishment is like a revenge thing or... I think the reason that she's the one who turns you to stone is that the lineage that she carries is the lineage of the death goddess, but it's the death goddess that's also the rebirth goddess, and that's what was lost in this sort of linear, this newer linear experience of consciousness that emerged at that time in human beings, we think, just based on like the way that the stories are before that and the way the stories are after that. But, um, so then she just becomes the death goddess because, you know, once I die, once my ego dies, I'm done. I'm dead. And it doesn't matter if something else is born because I'm gone and I'm the only me and I'm, you know, I'm American and I'm, I'm so important, right? So we have a really different experience of the death goddess. Um, and one of the things that happened in, the, in my research was because of this personal component, I got to a certain place in the Greek mythology where I kind of found a hold, I couldn't find, I didn't know what the, I couldn't find the next step. 
you couldn't find it in the stories. It's like a lacuna is the name you know, word for that. It's just kind of a cool word. There's this gap. And I had to turn to other stories. I had to turn to um, Sumerian stories of Arishka, Gillen, and Anna. Mm -hmm. And, and um, find an embodied, uh, you know, more feminine, pre-patriarchal kind of, or right on the cusp, um, way of understanding. Because I couldn't get from, you know, from A to, mm -hmm. to C. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I argue that that, that heap is legitimate um, academically because of these connections with the Gorgon and these other traditions. And Arishka Gil and the Gorgon are very, very parallel. Mm -hmm. And Inanna and Athena are very, very parallel. So for me, and you know, that's the kind of mythologist that I am, because I'm an archetypal mythologist. I'm interested in that emotion, that underlying reality. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get somebody who's, you know, there are other, there are other mythologists who would look at that and frown. <laughs> And you know, say you're being too general or whatever. Some of the same kind of criticisms that people, people like Campbell received. Or, but I'm really in this because of, of the vitality of it and the ability to, of it to give life meaning mm -hmm. and heal. Because I'm a healer. I'm interested in people living a joyful, full, loving life in this life with all of its pain and all of its complication. I've been a hospice breathing and counselor and I'm, so I'm interested in how that really manifests in real people's lives and my own. So I'm, I'm willing to, to skip across cultures and times and, and look for those underlying um, archetypal resonances. Well, that's the web of life. All that's my version. Yeah. <laughs> But I recognize that it's, it is a choice, and, and not, not everybody who does this kind of work is going to agree with that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, would you be willing to talk a little bit about your experience in your life? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have a sense of what you're curious about? I, I, I think, you know, I've seen him, but we all are curious about, you know, what that is. And yeah, I mean, yeah, no, that's okay. I just, I just, there's, a, there's a lot of possibilities, and so I just wanted to get a feel for what you were asking. Well, what we were yeah. Kind of just discussing yeah. this thing. Kind of <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, I, so, um, so the experience itself was very surprising. Um, I didn't really have uh, a, a, a sort of a religious um, construction for it. Um, so, um, so the experience itself was um, that I was hemorrhaging, and I'd been hemorrhaging for a few hours. I didn't know that because it was an internal hemorrhage, and so there was no. I mean, I was in a lot of terrible pain. And and but you couldn't you know you couldn't see anything. So so um, I finally got to the point where I just got very very weak and um, lost consciousness. And um, there were sort of two points. One was when that happened, and 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 I was unconscious for a little while. And when I woke back, woke up or became conscious again, I was aware of um, I was aware that. I was in the presence of something. Something, I mean, the, the, the descriptions are never very, um, they lack what's needed, the words do. But, but the feeling was that I knew that I was, I knew something terrible was going on. I knew that there was something terrible. I was a horrendous man, I was throwing up in the infection, right? Clearly something terrible is going on. You're seven months pregnant, you don't want to have that going on, right? Um, and before that, I had been in a lot of panic. And, um, and you know, we've been in touch with God. And I'm like, oh, there's all that activity and panic. But when I, when I regained consciousness, I felt very, very, very calm. Now, I didn't have an agreement. I mean, that's that agreement. It wasn't about agreement. It was about, it was just, it, it, it probably made me surrender. But it, that makes it sound like I made a choice. Like I surrendered. But I didn't. It wasn't. Like that, but there were, it was surrender. It was calm, and it was a sense of being held. 
It was a sense that whatever, whatever field I was in was so much bigger than me. And whatever um, my personality or my ego thought or felt about what was going on was completely irrelevant. And it, that didn't feel bad or mean or unfair, it just was true. And that no matter what happened, I was, I was okay and I was going to be okay. And it didn't mean be okay was like I was going to live or anything nice was going to happen. It was just like, and okay is such a, a lame way of saying it, but it's like the right, it's as close as I can get right now. Um, so there was this experience of being held in this field of, of love, of compassion, um, and, and, a, and a sense of, of sort of creatureliness. And for me, the quality of the field was feminine. That's probably just because of who I am, right? Um, and, and, and the other quality of it was that even in the midst of something terrible happening, um, which uh, evoked a lot of, ultimately it evoked you know, issues of shame and the sense of loss of control and the sense of failing and the only thing that had ever met, you know, all that stuff a therapy after that. Um, but but in the same, in, at the same time that, that I was being really seen and, and I was not found wanting. Right? And it was very mysterious. Right? And it was very um, surreal. And I felt... So, so then... Um, and, and what I knew at that point was that it was time to go to the hospital. Right? And so that's what I... That's what we gotta go to the and, and I was I was able to be calm through everything that happened after that, which was a lot. A couple of surgeries and a bunch of things through the night. And and, um, and I felt like, I mean, much later, what I felt was that that whatever I, mean, I remember encountering a Hindu text. I'm pretty sure it's a Hindu text. You guys might be able to help me out. But it talks about um, you know, the Hindus do a good job of looking at different kinds of con different levels of consciousness and, and knowing what those kind of what they are and defining those. And one of the conscious one form of consciousness is a dream consciousness where where we have the experience of going back to the source. Or some part of our soul or our soul, we have a soul that goes back to the source and things. And that's that when I read that, that, that was an epiphany. That was like, oh, that's what happened. I mean, who knows what happened. But there was that sense of recognition. Of like, oh, I finally found something that explained what I felt. And so I felt like I had been resourced for everything that came after. And I, I'm not, and my sense of that is that I would have died if that hadn't happened. I mean, I would have gone ahead and died and not come back. Because it would have been too much. Because then, later on that night, I had another hemorrhage. And when I had lost one baby, and they were in the process of moving the other, and I, they also were losing me, and that's when I had sort of the classic... I'm up in the looking down on the light and all that classic thing. And there was sort of an exchange that happened. And I feel like I've, my always, I've always felt that that first experience of that, and I feel like they're both near death. I don't, I definitely, that language, I've read a lot of the near death literature, and that language is not always all that great either. But um, that it's somehow resourced, right? And so you can, I mean, clearly that influences the way that I understand these myths. Right? Um, I, I have a lens that I'm looking through, and I have a lens of experience, a body of experience that I'm looking through. So um, I think part of why I see so much of that lineage piece is because I felt like I came back into that lineage also. That I had, and I didn't know that, I didn't have any of that language until much, much, much later, until after dissertation, right? There's so much processing, there's so much reflection that has to go on um, to make meaning. And the stories really help, but there's also this, this process of reflection. So, I mean, that's kind of what comes to mind anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, like I said, not ready to die, but I also, um, whatever it is, it's going to be okay. It's a mystery. But it's not the enemy. It's just the next whatever. And whether it, I, there's any kind of consciousness or awareness or anything, I have no idea. I mean, I know what, what my body's going to do. But um, 
somehow it's not a problem. Strange thing to talk about, but thank you for that. Yeah. Well, it's one of the reasons I was so drawn to hospice work. Um, yeah, because there's also something about the metaphor of, of death and regeneration is the is the, rea the lived reality of the way that um, one's perspective can be refocused over and over in a really joyous and positive way by the proximity of, of death, which seems odd to people who haven't done that kind of work, and it's not morbid, it's not masochistic, and it's just this, and it's also really sad, and you don't, it's not one or the other, it's the capacity to hold that contradiction and have more than one experience at the same time. Oh. Oh, you yeah. go, you go. Oh, okay. Uh, I was curious about you talked about dreams, mm -hmm. and I mean, if you don't want to share, that's fine. I'm sort of curious what you were seeing in the dreams that you related to Medusa. Was it literally her, or were there any that? Yeah. Did you talk about any of that in your book, or? From time to time, um, yeah. I mean, there there were I mean, there are a couple times I think that I talk about dreams that were sort of um, pivotal. I think with her, um, she, she never appeared like exact, like a, like the Greek, you know, the yeah. Greek mask, but um, but uh, imagery associating uh, the feminine with, with serpents, a lot of that kind of imagery. Um, um, I also had a series of dreams that, that to me were Medusa, even though it wasn't um, overtly her. And, and that had to do with dreaming about this, this black tar um, stuff. Like just oh, dream after dream after dream. It was on the floor, it's in the walls. And, and that, was towards a, that was during a time when I ultimately ended up um, having to have surgery because the endometriosis, um, one of the, the forms they can take is it creates this sort of um, uh, tar-like, sticky substance that just that it, that, and it makes the organs adhere to each other. And so the disease was progressing really, really extremely. And I started to have a lot of, of bowel symptoms. I had block, you know, blockages. I had infections. I had blah, blah. So, so that was, to me, that the, the darkness of that, the undergroundness of that, the sort of snakiness of that, um, the death aspect of it, um, those all felt Medusa, even though she wasn't, um, you know, wasn't an image of her. There's nothing about black tar related to her or with the blood. Because I, I remember oh. reading something that, where one interpretation was the, the blood from her neck was poisonous. It's yes. sort of like a, yeah, a, a reading size, that didn't one go. One size poisonous and one oh, size okay. life giving, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, there was that kind of that's, and those were the kinds of associations that I that, that came to me as I worked with those with dreams like that. Um, yeah, and so sometimes it was Devin and I were in, we, we Devin and Aaron and I were in this mythological program together, and Devin and I were working as a pair once in one of the courses we had to go outside. I can't remember what the assignment was, but we were doing some kind of imagery, and it was like. Un completely unconscious, <laughs> you know. I come up with this image and create this image. And, oh, well, there she is. You know, it's this Medusa, and it was more the Medusa of the um, jellyfish, but it was there she was, and it was the sort of yeah, ironic. I, I can't remember if it was dissertation formulation or what it was, but I just was not getting good. So then sometimes she'd show up really overtly. Yeah, yeah. I was just yeah. I really wanted to get away. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. Mm. Yes. In your quest, did you ever do where you go back into previous lives? You know, I did not. Just that's just not uh, one of the modalities. Mm -hmm. um, I did do a, I did do a, um, 
wilderness fast where I went into um, a western canyon and, and part of a 12, 14 day process um, fasted alone for four days and five nights. And that was, um, uh, that I, I was able to access other sorts of um, forms of consciousness under those conditions, but I don't, I don't tend to frame them in that. But I do have the sense of, of the lineage of this kind of um, trauma, both psychologically and physiologically. And so um, that's just, I just frame it in a different language. Yeah. And I mean, even just from the medical perspective, there's a, there's a, uh, the disease of endometriosis runs in families. If you have a first degree relative, mother, sister, aunt, you have a much higher um, risk factor. So there's, there's this like concrete piece, and then there's also um, uh, psycho-spiritual. And I've had, you know, I had different understandings of what had happened to me. Um, through the years, and some of them were more lineage-based, and some of them weren't, as I sort of tried to unpack this experience um, so that it had meaning. Because what wasn't all, what I couldn't tolerate was that what I had experienced was meaningless. And that was just something, again, just something in my temperament or my soul or whatever, whatever your language is. And so I was drawn constantly, you know, to work. And, and figure out what this meant. That that was a, a redemption that I could provide, an atonement, really. Um, so, yeah. yeah I was just gonna uh, quickly comment on what you're saying. I'm really struck by the metaphor of how you use the uh, Athena's shield of reflection to avoid the petrification of your own spirit from this experience. Absolutely. Another surprise. <laughs> yeah. Because reflection has been absolutely essential. I think I think there have probably been a couple times in my life, in my very young life, when I encountered this energy unmediated. And um, yeah. It can be a psychosis. Yeah, these are powerful energies. I mean, you know, we have both nice clinical words or not so nice clinical words. <laughs> We're framing these experiences now, but um, they're powerful energies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I have a few things, I guess, um, but I'll keep it quick. Um, I'm just so glad that this talk is happening at the same time as this exhibit. I feel like I could have called it Gorgons of Opus. It's just I, I didn't really realize how much of that was related to um, Medusa. Um, so I just kind of want to appreciate that, and it has me thinking a lot about this really, as you're saying, this like archaic relationship that these different goddesses share as an ancestry, like what they've come out of, including Hecate, um, who is very much a death goddess, obviously. Um, but who also has this power to witness trauma. Um, she's, she's the one witnessing the abduction of Persephone. She's the one that keeps the agreement between Hades and Demeter. It's, um, so I'm just finding it interesting to think about. I don't have an answer for this. I'm just throwing it into the mix. But um, one other thing I wanted to bring up was did you write at all about Athena's relationship with Dionysus? Did that come in? No, I mean, I did encounter it. Yeah. And, and again, there's so many threads that um, that, that was, but, but it's important because, um, well, there are lots of reasons. And I did touch on it a little bit about when I looked at Athena's quality of, of, of motherhood, because she's a virgin goddess, right? She is. One of her um, ident identifications is as a mother, yeah. and she's the mother of Apollos. Mm -hmm. So, and she's she's the foster mother of Dionysus, and Dionysus is the usurper, and he is the deity that overthrows Zeus. So yeah. it happens anyway. You cannot get away from your faith. Yeah, <laughs> and the the reason I thought it might be interesting too is because in Orphic myth, there's a story about Athena. She saves Dionysus's heart. It's her that comes in 
to preserve this heart. Yeah. And for them, it's a little bit of a parable that like oh, the intellect saves the, you know, the soul. Um, but I think there's more to it than that. And yeah, it does seem like she would be an unlikely uh, redeemer of, of these characters. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I actually feel like Medusa redeems Athena. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think I mean, so for, too. for a while I thought maybe they're going to but it, it ends up being like... I think yeah. Dionysus as well. But it, yeah. you know, on the surface, sometimes it looks like... Well, and your, your comment about the witches and the Hecate, I mean, again, like it's, like there's, these are archetypal energy patterns of potential, then they can take on many masks, many forms, right? And so we recognize the, 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 the energy you know, behind the different masks or different forms. And, um, and so, yeah, that's when, that's when it starts to be that sort of psycho-spiritual resonance and connection. Even if there's, um, sometimes there is a concrete or historical or, you know, mythological connection, and sometimes it's more just that sense of, this is that same energy, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. And, and for me, a big piece of this was that as long as that energy, I mean, there's a strong association also with the Gorgon imagery and um, uh, anatomically, with the vulva and with um, the uterus, and um, and so for me there was a, a lot of this process too had to do with um, where am I going to wear that mask, right? Because if if the this this goddess power is a, a, is approached with an attitude, the the ego attitude, which you know the Buddhists teach us that it's that we split things into aversion or attraction. And so I kind of take that to the next step, the ego attitude towards the, the feminine of scorn or appetite. Right. And when this power is, is attended to or met with that attitude, it is highly destructive. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, my own, I think that's one of the ways that it played out, you know. And again, we like the word psychoid. When we us Jungian types because it's this mysterious word that, that blurs the lines between mind and matter without it being a linear cause. And it's really important because there's been a tradition in, in medicine of, of um, telling women it's all in their heads and that this isn't real. And that women, I mean, I literally read accounts of women being hospitalized in psychiatric units for you know, a couple of years by their physician because they didn't have a diagnosis because you have to do surgery to diagnose this disease. So I'm, I'm constantly aware that in this literalistic, materialistic paradigm that we're in, I have to be really space that, that maybe I can then um, live with this disease in a more functional way. That's a beautiful right. way to put it. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I'm late to the okay. lecture. I read the mention just uh, about, but um, do you still have endometriosis? Yes, actually, I, I do. It doesn't actually go away. Some people do go into remission. Um, I've had um, pretty complete surgery at this point. I've had more than one, but the last one about 10 years ago um, was um, radical hysterectomy and, and some other um, surgical interventions. And so, in theory, um, you know, uh, you think that would you get rid of the sorts of estrogen, you should get rid of the disease, but I had about seven years without symptoms, and in the last two or three years, I'm my only symptomatic again. So part of that is the, um, the ovaries aren't the only source of estrogen. Um, part of that is the disease itself generates estrogen. Um, and Part of that is probably that our environment is pretty messed up these days. There are a lot of pseudoestrogens. There's a lot of, of estrogen in our food, and I mean, I try to eat clean, and, but you know, this is the world that we live in. Um, so, whatever that's about, I, I am mildly symptomatic, but um, you know, in a, it's better than it was. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking about this topic. Um, I, I I had surgery a year ago mm -hmm. uh, for endometriosis and. 
um, it, I was just, I, ever since then, I've been reading a lot and talking to a lot of people, and it's just shocking how lacking, uh, you know, yeah. it's, it should be a part of, you know, public discussion, especially um, with women, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and I also have had so much, my imagery has been really intense in dreams and active imaginations, and it has been all serpent, black tar, and yeah. jellyfish. And I have encountered that from some other people who emailed me when they read, you know, and said, oh my gosh, yeah, I had the cold. And so that was sort of a, that also resonated and, and made me feel like this is a, just my story, right? This is, um, this is a voice among voices, and so I really appreciate you speaking as well, because, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody <coughs> else? Did you have something? Yeah. Could you add to the uh, uh, energy pattern of Medusa's, of, of her vision, I guess? Um, let's see. Let's see if you can clarify your question. Well, I noticed know. that Tolton's all-seeing eye. Mm. Uh, has uh, many of the same qualities, okay. and yet there's an attraction, and there's also a repulsion. Right. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, uh, whether you look at the Medusa or she looks at you, that yeah. that energy yeah. exchange right. takes place. Yeah, and so you know, it, it's interesting because it varies from story to story. Which is the petrifying thing? Because there are some stories where you know you can you can like sneak up, and as long as you don't catch her eye or whatever. But so there's some paradox there. Um, but you're, you're, yeah, the idea about the eye is such a, an important piece of this, and the, the fascination and the um, the power of the eye, and, and part of what that where that led was this whole um, this whole, sort of whole complex called the evil eye, and the, and the evil eye superstitions. And which are really ubiquitous and quite ancient, and they have the, they have that sense of carrying the, the evil through the eye. And the amulets, including the gorgon, was a huge amulet, amulet all over the Mediterranean and Greece to protect against the evil eye. So there's this they call it ap apotropaic. It's a big fancy word, which basically just means that the evil the evil face, the evil eye, that protects you from evil by reflecting it back, right? So that's that's part of this evil eye piece, and it's part of this power of the eye. And Gavutas' work looks at that being a quality of the, the great goddesses um, in that great goddess, those great goddess traditions um, of the, the power of the eye, um, to both be life-giving and death-giving. And it can get really interesting. You can even get into sort of attachment theory and, and the psychological aspect of being seen and not being seen, and what happens to infants if they're not actually seen. And so there's this whole dynamism around what the eye is. And there are also connections between the evil eye um, superstitions, and what I really came to feel was that menstrual um, taboos are a subset of the evil eye um, uh, tradition or uh, superstitions, and because they function in very similar ways, and they're just very um, so I think that I think it's really powerful. And this whole idea of the word fascination and fascinating and being fascinated and mesmerized. And there was a lot of, of playing with the language around that because there really is something there. Um, and, and the eye of a god, you know, to be to, to see a god. I mean, you know, really Medusa is not unusual. You look at any god and I mean Zeus, there's stories about Zeus, you know. Don't Oh, please show me how you really are. Oh, she goes up in flames, right? I mean, it, you can't, but with Medusa, it's a capital crime. <laughs> you know, she, she gets her head cut off for being like that. But, but there's something about a direct human contact with the numinous, with the archetypal in its raw form that, that we don't, that the, the, the wisdom seems to be that our psyche can't tolerate that, that it will incinerate us or paralyze us or petrify us or kill us or something. So I think from a psychological perspective, it's interesting because I think trauma starts to play into what happens to us. So trauma when we're paralyzed, when we're petrified. PTSD is that kind of petrifying experience. 
um, where your back feeling that and you're paralyzed and you can't move or whatever, right? Uh, so I think that's really rich. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, hey, well, you almost answered my question. I was, uh, I was wondering if you think the story of Lot and his wife turning to kill yeah. herself is another related yeah. in this. Yeah, you know, there's a, there are lots of stories about the danger of looking back. Yeah. Um, there, the Orpheus story is that way, too. Right at the end, he looks back. Um, yeah, I, that's really, I really have to think about that, because I think you are on something really intriguing, because there is that, um, you know, the pillar of salt, and being, you know, petrified in that way, and being, um, I haven't, I hadn't, Pondered it, but I mean, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. It's punished for curiosity. Yeah, which is a, which is sort of the Pandora story too, and, and there are some other stories like that. Um, it's it's curiosity, and it's also I mean potentially is it about um, is she still connected because she's the the feminine quality of relationship, and they're leaving their community, and so she can't help but look back. Because she's the, the the function of relatedness, she's that connective tissue. So I mean, I think there are lots of ways you could look at it, um, depending on what what perspectives feel most alive for you. But yeah, it's, it's there's something there. Yeah, something to think about. Something to home and think about. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Um, well, I was just gonna say evil eye superstitions that I know or have read about are also associated a lot with envy, I guess. That's, yeah. I was just going to bring that because yeah, that's what I've that always... Yeah, and that with the Athena and Medusa story, okay. potentially, you know, depending on what, what take you get on that, um, uh, that version, the other version where, you know, she's... Yeah. I was going to say, too, just because Black Tar came up twice... <laughs> Um, you, you know, my brother and I have been talking about dreams for many years, and he had one that goes back several years that, you know, where there are like people are sort of playing by a lake, and he goes out into the lake to join them, and then suddenly the lake is black tar, but he's the only one who notices it. Mm -hmm. And this is one we talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that motif in a while, but. Uh, kind of goes to the whole um, poisonous blood and blood being life, yeah. kind of, because we associate the water with life and all that. So. And the Greeks lit their tar on fire. Oh, no. that was Greek fire. It was one of their great weapons. Oh, okay. I didn't. Yeah, I haven't thought about that image in a long time. But. I think that. I mean, I think you know, as I'm listening to you guys, that uh, obviously there's like that's like a, its own archetype. Too. Yes. And I'm thinking of a Star Trek episode <laughs> oh, yeah. where, where one of them falls, there's like some kind of tar monster. And well, there's a lot of good. Into it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there's something about that that's even resonant. It's got its own energy. It's got an energy associated with this, and then it seems like it also. So again, that's when we know we're in that that about zone zone of some kind of archetypal and energy that that seems to gravitate towards this particular form, and then you're going to get into some both personal and, and universal kinds of relationships to that. Have you seen yeah. Spirited Away? Yes. Does that like yeah. speak to that to you for you? I mean, yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great movie. Yeah. Well, I'm aware that it's almost quarter after, so I really want to thank you all so much for your time and sharing this time with me and listening and, and sharing thoughts and ideas too. It's really it keeps this alive for me too and really rich and um, and um, makes it something more than just this sort of uh, personal thing, which is just not that's that's a beginning place. It's not an ending place. So that connection is really important to me. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.